thank you for watching today. We like being number one, don't we? In fact, we like our favorite college or professional team to win, don't we? People remember the winners, but seldom do they remember those teams who are number two or number three. We want to be remembered, not forgotten. And today we're going to see that we can be winners in the eyes of God when we aren't selfish, but we look out for others in addition to ourselves. So this week we continue in that unit that's entitled Dealing with Messy Relationships. We're in the fifth lesson. It's called Yield. The scripture passage is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 and 13 through 15. And the point is humbly place the needs of others before your own. Well, a good place to start in this lesson would be to define the word yield. What does that mean to yield? Well, when I use that word, it usually has to do with traffic. But what does that have to do with living a Christian life or dealing with messy relationships? Well, if you think about the traffic scenario, when, when you yield, you basically let somebody else go first. As I enter the on-ramp, I yield to those cars who are already on the interstate. They, they were there first, and, and they have the right-of-way. Basically, I submit to the other cars because they have the authority or the right to be in that lane. But in the Christian life, yielding expands that thought. Yielding or submitting is not just the responsibility uh, of the subordinate person, the one who doesn't have the right-of-way, but it also applies to the one with the right-of-way, to yield to those who don't have the same rights as you who are subordinate to you. Now this week, we're in the book of Philippians. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. Now it's known as an epistle of joy because that word, that word joy is used so much in that book. Well, let's read the first couple of verses uh, from, our, from our text this week. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul's writing, and he says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and of mind. Now, did you note the four qualities that mark unity with Christ? That the, They're mentioned in verse 1. They're, they were encouragement, comfort, fellowship, and Tenderness and compassion. Now, our lesson text here in chapter 2, is it's continuing a thought that Paul started back in chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. And that is having a unified mind. Many people having a unified mind. And most translations start off with that word, if. And it's used several times in those two verses. If you have any encouragement. Uh, if you have any comfort. If you have any fellowship. And that word if is a good translation, it's a correct translation, but probably a better word might be since. Um, there was no question about whether or not the people in the church at Philippi had any comfort or uh, encouragement or those other qualities. It's an if that has an implied yes response. Like if your boss is talking to you and says, if you're an employee here, you will arrive on time. Well, you are an employee. There's no question about that. The underlying meaning here is, since you are an employee here, blah, blah, blah. So, since they have encouragement, comfort, fellowship, and then we get to those words, tenderness and compassion. Now, if you're a King James person, you'll notice that instead of tenderness, it has the word bowels. Now, that's a word we don't use a lot in Sunday school, do we? But in the day that, that Paul's writing here, bowels were considered the, the seat of compassion, um, we continue that meaning a little bit today when we say that we have a, a gut feeling about something. See, people in Paul's day use the word bowels like we might use the word heart as the, as the center of compassion. So, you know, if that thought had really continued strongly until 1992, Billy Ray Cyrus may have sung that song, Don't Tell My Bowels, My Icky Breaky Bowels. Well, let's move along. So Paul says, since there is encouragement from Christ, and since there is a comfort from his love, and, and since there's a fellowship in the Spirit, and tenderness and compassion, since you have all these, then make my joy complete. Make me proud. And how, how are we supposed to do that? By being unified. And the best indicator of being unified is, is what? It's, it's being like-minded. Now what does that mean? Does that mean everyone's going to agree on everything? 
No, it doesn't. <laughs> it certainly doesn't. Does it mean that everybody is going to think alike, look alike? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Being a believer is not about everybody looking and thinking and talking the same. It's not like being assimilated into the Borg, for you Star Trek fans, but it's being, being like-minded doesn't make us robots, but it does mean that we have a common purpose, we have a common goal, and we're striving toward that same goal. Now take a sports team, for instance. The goal of everyone on the sports team is to what? It's to win the game. Now everyone's not the same. Not everyone uh, is the quarterback. Not everyone is the same size. Everybody has, some are strong runners, strong, some are strong in the arms, some are just bulky. It takes a variety of people with differing gifts and skill sets to make a successful football team. So the same is true in a band, isn't it? Different instrumentalists play different notes on different instruments at different times to produce a beautiful melody. And that's true in marriage as well. To, to have a good marriage, it doesn't mean uh, that two people have to have the same hobbies and the same tastes in food. You know, a good marriage is composed of two people with the same values, the same common goals and purpose. So that brings us back to the church. Paul wants the Philippians, a group of people with gift, differing gifts and abilities, to, to remember that, that they come together with their differences for a common purpose and, and common values, common goal. Similar to the motto of the United States written in Latin on our currency, e pluribus unum, or out of many, one. Now this reminds me of an illustration that I've used many times. I've even talked about it in, in other uh, videos I've done. I used to think that Christians were like bricks that, com that comprised a wall, and, and the mortar that holds us together was the Holy Spirit. And that's bit, not too bad of an illustration. But I used that many times, and it occurred to me one time, we're not all the same. Unity does not mean uniformity. We're not all the same size and shape, and so instead of a brick wall, it occurred to me that we're more like a stone wall. We're composed of differing shapes and sizes, and some jut out a little bit more, and some are sharp and some are not, and some are, are large and noticeable, and some are small, but vital to the integrity of the wall. But it's still that Holy Spirit that, that's our mortar that binds us together. All of that to explain unity. <laughs> now, let's read on verses 3 through 5 of Philippians chapter 2. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. See, if Christians in the church are to be like-minded and to have a, a common purpose, then, then we don't need any rogue members out looking out only for themselves. That's selfish ambition. In contrast to that self-serving mindset, Paul tells the Philippians, and, and then by extension us, to humbly consider others better than yourself. So before we go on, I always like to define things. It, 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 it's important to properly define what humility is. It will probably better is to first say what humility is not. It's not thinking badly of yourself. You know, if Tom Brady were to give an interview and he sheepishly, sheepish, sheepishly said, you know, I'm really not that good of a quarterback, uh, that's not humility. You know, regardless of what NFL team you root for, that's both not true and not humility. Now, it may be false humility, which is saying something negative about yourself so that others will praise you and pat you on the back. You see, humility is the opposite of arrogance, opposite of pride, pretty much the opposite of what's being taught as self-esteem these days. So what does humility look like in relationship to others? Well, humility is an, is an honest opinion of yourself. It's not inflated. It's not overrated. Uh, a person with a humble attitude knows their limitations and their need for help in certain areas from others. At the same time, this realistic and honest self-opinion uh, will realize one's own strengths and, and make it available to those who need help in that area. So how does humility contribute to unity? Well, it does so because helping one another strengthens each other. And your strength your strength is making up for my weakness. And, and I realize what my weaknesses are because I have a humble attitude. Therefore, the, the whole team or the whole church is stronger. You see, if, if I'm only looking out for myself, I'm only one person, look, one person looking out for myself. I don't have 360 degree vision either. But in a group of 10, if I'm looking out for everybody else and they're looking out for me, then I have nine people looking out for my best interest, not just me, not just one. 
So this is true on the sports team. It's true in the church as well. In verse 5, Paul transitions from talking about humility. Uh, the humility of, uh, He transitions from talking about humility to giving us an example of, of what humility is. Now, in that first lesson in our unit, we learned that, that we're to love as Christ loved. In the third lesson, we learned that we are to forgive as we've been forgiven. And this week, we're going to see that as we're to yield or, or to submit to each other as Christ submitted. In verses 6 through 11, which, which aren't in our lessons, lesson text this week, Paul explains how Jesus humbled himself. He said he, he was God, but he didn't consider that was something to grasp or something to hold on to. How many times do we grasp uh, our position at work or home or church because that's not my job or that's beneath me. Well, that's not humility. Jesus had the ultimate title of God and he didn't consider that ben consider it beneath him to humble himself, yield his rights for the benefit of others. You see, he became a servant. He, uh, he paid the ultimate sacrifice at death on a cruel cross and that's our example of humility. And that's brought out in the hymn to God be the glory that says he yielded his life, and atonement for sin. Now let's read the last section of our text this week. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And it says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine like stars in the sky. See, being humble is not natural, is it? What's natural is, is selfishness, is to look out for number one. And as much as I love my two grandsons, um, it's quite evident that selfishness is natural and sharing is learned. That's my train, Mama. Mama Charlie's on my bed. Make him move. You know, it's, it's not natural to be humble. But humility is in the character of God, and it is God that works in us that allows us to be humble. I love what Tony Evans says about this verse. He says, the reason the Philippians could uh, work out their salvation, which was mentioned a uh, verse or two earlier, was because God had already been working in them. God had already deposited within them that which was to be worked out. He gives us the desire and the ability to obey. Obedience is not based on our willpower, but on God's power working in us. It's good stuff. Now, verse 14 gives us a command that is so difficult to follow. Do everything without grumbling or complaining. Do you know with someone that they'll do anything for the church, but they're going to let you know how much they've been inconvenienced or how much uh, they had to give up in order to, to do this task? Well, that's not the way it should be. That's not humility. <laughs> think of Christ's example. Do you think he sat around and said, you know, guys, you just don't realize what I had to give up just to come down here and lead you knuckleheads. No, he didn't do that. He was humble. He was obedient, a servant. None of this pity me comments coming from Jesus. So Paul's final analogy in our lesson text this week compares the children of God to stars and a warped and crooked generation to the dark night sky. See, if you're humble, if you look out for the interest of others and, and don't complain about it, you will shine brightly in the sin-darkened uh, world that you live in. If individuals look out only for themselves and complain all the time, your, your light's dimmed. And, and what attractive, what's attractive about that? Well, nothing. So in closing, think about your life and honestly evaluate your attitude. Do you have what I jokingly call the spiritual gift of complaining? There's nothing attractive about that. Now, are, are you more concerned about your rights than the needs of others? People both inside the church and outside the church, they notice that, so you're really not fooling anybody. I'd like to leave you with a final personal example as I get on my soapbox for just a minute. This week's Sunday School lesson is about yielding. It's about giving up your rights for the benefit of others. Now, as churches begin to open up around the country, several of you watching this may be of the mindset of, I don't have to wear a mask when I go to church. That's my right, and I'm not going to do it. Well, would you take this lesson to heart and reevaluate your attitude? Uh, most of you know that my wife has stage 4 colon cancer and is currently on chemo and has had her spleen removed. So she definitely has what's called a compromised immune system. And even though she hasn't been to church since 
our church service since Christmas Eve it isn't coming back anytime soon. Uh, when the doors, when we start opening up here in the next few weeks, I'm going to be here. And yes, you may feel fine and believe you don't have the virus, but let me remind you that one of our church members' mother died early this morning in our local nursing home. She was tested positive for COVID-19, but she didn't have any symptoms. She didn't have any fever, no breathing problems, none of that. So all this to say, when you come to church, would you consider giving up your right not to wear a mask for the benefit of Ruth and benefit of others? I, I hate to carry that virus home to her. You know, she certainly doesn't need that on top of everything else, all the other health issues in her life at this point. If you don't attend church where I do, I'm sure there's someone like my wife in your church or community who could possibly be negatively affected by you exercising your right not to wear a mask. All right, I'm down off my soapbox now. Now, next week's lesson is our final in the unit, and it's, it's on being accepting. Okay, so we're going to be looking at that next week. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great week. Stay safe.